Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. In the last video, we looked at the definition of entropy, which is a way of describing the degree of disorder in a system. We saw that Ludwig Boltzmann defined the entropy this way, where the quantity omega is the number of microstates that the system can be in. We also saw that the second law of thermodynamics states that, during a spontaneous process, the number of microstates always increases. It's hard to express just how large the number of microstates is for a typical system, but let's try to get a sense of it. Suppose we have a system that has an entropy of 1.00 joules per kelvin. How many microstates are there in this system? To find out, we'll use this equation. As you might recall, Kb is Boltzmann's constant, which is equal to r divided by Avogadro's number. When we solve the equation for omega, we find out that it's equal to e raised to the power of 7.243 times 10 to the 22nd. That's a huge number. It's so large that no computer in the world could ever calculate it. That's because a macroscopic system, that is, a system that's large enough to be seen with our eyes and experimented on, has many trillions of trillions of particles. That makes these systems much larger and more complex than the systems we looked at in the last video, where there were only five or so particles. That means that the system can be in an enormous number of possible microstates. But that makes it very difficult to use this equation to determine the entropy of a system. Instead, it would be helpful if we could determine the entropy without having to know the number of microstates. That's what we'll spend the rest of this video learning to do. And the person we have to thank for it was the American physicist Josea Gibbs. Gibbs determined that the entropy could also be expressed this way. Where did this equation come from? Well, we know that the disorder of a system increases as we add heat, so it makes sense that the change in entropy is proportional to the change in heat. However, the entropy can't just be equal to the change in heat. Here's why. Back in video 17, we saw that heat is a path function. In other words, the change in heat depends on the method we use to get from the initial state to the final state. For example, in that video we saw this diagram, and we saw that we could get from the initial state to the final state via an isothermal path. When we did, we saw that the heat change was equal to nRT, times the logarithm of v2 over v1. However, when we get from the initial to the final state via an adiabatic path, followed by a constant volume path, the overall heat change was Cv delta t. So heat is a path function. It matters how we got from the initial to the final state. However, we saw in the last video that entropy is not a path function. The difference in the disorder between the initial and final states is the same no matter how we got from one state to the other. So the heat and the entropy can't be equivalent since one is a path function and the other is a state function. However, it turns out that the heat change for a reversible process divided by the temperature is a state function, and that's part of the reason that Gibbs suggested this formula as the definition of entropy. This is a much easier way to determine the entropy of a macroscopic system than the equation developed by Boltzmann. However, after Gibbs proposed the idea, it was almost overlooked forever. It turns out that Gibbs wasn't a very good communicator, and when he published his discoveries, it was in a fairly obscure journal, The Transactions of the Connecticut Academy. It might have faded into obscurity, but luckily, it was noticed by the Scottish physicist James Clerk Maxwell, who recognized that Gibbs had made an important discovery and publicized it so that other scientists would hear about it. It really pays to learn to talk about your work when you're a scientist. It's one reason you learn to write good lab reports on your experiments when you take a chemistry course in college. There's one more interesting consequence of the fact that entropy is a state function. Imagine that your system starts at an initial state with a pressure, volume, and temperature of P1, V1, and T1. We then change the system using a variety of paths. 
Sometimes we use an isothermal path, sometimes a constant pressure path, sometimes constant volume, sometimes adiabatic, and sometimes none of these. However, at the end of this series of processes, the final state of the system is exactly the same as the initial state, so we've returned the system to its initial conditions. In this case, because entropy is a state function, the initial and final states of the system have exactly the same entropy, so delta s equals zero. We can express this using this equation. This symbol means that the integral occurs for a cyclic process meaning that the initial and final states are identical. A similar equation would be true for all state functions, like enthalpy and energy. So, how exactly do we use this equation to determine the entropy? Let's try it using the four limiting cases that we looked at back in video 17. First was the isothermal case. Back in video 17, we saw that the heat change for an isothermal process is given by this formula. According to Gibbs' equation, we can calculate the entropy just by taking the derivative of the heat with respect to temperature and then integrating. When we do, here's what we get. So, this is an equation that we can use to calculate the change in the entropy of a system at constant temperature. Similarly, for the adiabatic process, the change in heat is zero, so that means the change in the entropy for the system will also be zero. Next is the constant volume process. For that process, we can use the fact that entropy is a state function. Therefore, the entropy it takes to get from this point to this point should be the same no matter how we get from one point to the other. That means that the sum of the entropies for the adiabatic and constant volume paths should be the same as for the isothermal path. Since the entropy for the adiabatic path is equal to zero, that makes the entropy for the constant volume path nr times the logarithm of v2 over v1, the same as for the isothermal path. Finally, let's take a look at a constant pressure process. The heat change for a constant pressure process is Cp delta T. Based on the Gibbs equation, we need to take the integral of the heat divided by T, so we need to solve this integral. If the heat capacity is a constant, which is nearly the case for liquids and solids, we can pop Cp out of the integral. If we then solve the integral, we find that delta s is equal to cp times the natural log of t2 over t1. So, now we've seen how to calculate the entropy for all four of our limiting cases. Isothermal processes, adiabatic processes, constant v, and constant p processes. You'll get plenty of practice trying out these equations in class and on the homework. In the next video, we'll tie this information together with all the information you got about heat, work, energy, and enthalpy for those four processes. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week!